Okay, so today we'll be talking about Chapter 17, Section 3, and the title of this is Teddy Roosevelt's Square Deal. Now, personally, I have to be honest, Teddy Roosevelt's one of my favorites. He's an outdoorsman, and I'm automatically just uh, identified with this person. He, he'd love being outside. But this individual also took that love of the outdoors and applied it to um, conservation. And uh, he had a deep love for our nation's natural resources. He also had a deep love for um, the social welfare of our people and seeing that corruption in our society was cleaned up. Uh, so personally, I, I like this individual. However, there, with any leader, um, there are things that we'll have to talk about that um, perhaps weren't the best. Uh, and so no one is perfect, um, but again, well, let me just show you as we get into this. We'll be talking about some of his progressive reforms. Yeah, and I wanted to start with this picture. I think it explains a lot about Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, um, he was an avid uh, equestrian. Um, he loved hunting, loved fishing, loved hiking. There are numerous pictures of this individual climbing mountains, exploring places all throughout our country. Uh, but anyway, I want to start with the speech of Teddy Roosevelt. On the national political landscape, the times seemed right for a progressive United States president. And one emerged, if only by a twist of fate. Six months after being elected president for the second time, William McKinley was assassinated, and his running mate, 42-year-old Vice President Theodore Roosevelt, succeeded him in 1901. He was the youngest person ever to hold that office. Roosevelt was born into a wealthy family, and although he suffered from asthma, he was determined to live an active life. From marksmanship, to horseback riding and tennis, to boxing and hunting, to his heroic exploits with the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War, Teddy Roosevelt proved a popular leader. First as governor of New York, and then as president. When asked why people so adored him, he said he thought it was because... I put into words what is in their hearts and minds, but not their mouths. Roosevelt outlined many progressive reforms to the American public and gave his plan a name, the Square Deal. When Roosevelt assumed office, over 80% of American business was owned by trusts. Although Congress had already enacted the Sherman Antitrust Act, it had not stopped the trusts from using unfair business practices to destroy their competition. Roosevelt began by suing the Northern Securities Railroad Trust. And in 1904, the Supreme Court agreed that the trust had become a monopoly and ordered it dissolved. Roosevelt's administration filed over 40 more suits. They pursued the beef industry, Standard Oil, the American Tobacco Company, and many other trusts. Americans overwhelmingly returned Roosevelt to the presidency in 1904 as he continued his work as a trust buster and a staunch proponent of governmental regulation of business. The many other progressives who were serving in local, state, and federal government helped Roosevelt to get the support he needed to get his proposed laws passed, like Mayor Samuel Golden Rule Jones of Toledo, Ohio, Governors Charles Acock of North Carolina, Albert Cummins of Iowa, and Fighting Bob La Follette of Wisconsin both of whom became United States Senators. Two years after his re-election, Roosevelt saw the Hepburn Act become law, which gave the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission the power to regulate the maximum fees railroads could charge. Roosevelt next turned his attention to questions surrounding public health. Like most Americans, he was horrified when he read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and even considered becoming a vegetarian he appointed a commission to investigate Sinclair's claims. A man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of the dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would put poisoned bread out for them. 
they would die, and then rats, bread, and meat would go in the hoppers together. Sinclair's charges of unsanitary conditions proved to be true. The commission confirmed his description of potted ham as a hash containing ground rope and pigskin. So in 1906, with Roosevelt's urging, Congress adopted the Meat Inspection Act. Federal inspectors would now guarantee safe, sanitary meat. That same year, more reforms followed with the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act. Manufacturers now had to list the contents of foods and drugs on labels and could not make exaggerated claims about a medicine's benefits. No deleterious drug, chemical, or preservative could be used in medicines or foods. Roosevelt brought the same enthusiasm to protecting America's natural resources that he did to leveling the business playing field. After graduating from Harvard University, a young Theodore Roosevelt had worked as a cattle rancher in the Dakotas. He quickly realized that ranchers were allowing cattle to overgraze the Great Plains, that farmers had cut down forests and plowed under the prairies, and that America's natural resources were being squandered. What will happen when our forests are gone, when the coal, the iron, the oil, and the gas are exhausted? As president, Roosevelt withdrew 148 million acres of forest land from public sale, an area larger than Germany. On the advice of his friend, naturalist John Muir, Roosevelt established over 50 wildlife sanctuaries, five national parks, and designated 18 national monuments. He also put fellow conservationist Gifford Pinchot in charge of supervising the national forests. The nation was obsessed by a fury of development. The American Colossus was fiercely intent on appropriating and exploiting the riches of the richest of all continents. Roosevelt was so determined that Americans realized that the country's resources were not endless that he even banned Christmas trees in the White House. Theodore Roosevelt ignored tradition and redefined the image and scope of the President of the United States. He chose to be vibrant, visible and accessible. Roosevelt was the people's choice throughout America and in turn America allowed him to use what he called his bully pulpit to accomplish his goals of reform and governmental regulation. However, a third term as president wasn't in keeping with tradition. So bowing to president, Roosevelt instead handpicked his successor. All right, so a little about Roosevelt's background. When he was a child, he was sick all of the time. And um, his parents were very concerned about his health. Uh, they sent him to numerous doctors. And eventually these doctors encouraged him to adopt a lifestyle uh, that was healthy, to eat healthy, to be active, and Roosevelt took that to heart. He became very involved in athletics. He got into boxing. He got into wrestling. He became an avid horse rider and hiker. And um, eventually, uh, he uh, pursued a career in politics. He rose through New York politics, eventually becoming the governor. In fact, prior to this, he entered the military in the Spanish-American War in 1898. He commissioned his own company called the Rough Riders. And um, they won quite a bit of fame for themselves uh, throughout the Spanish-American War. In New York, Roosevelt was a very successful politician and governor. The political bosses found they could not control him. Roosevelt refused to be manipulated or bought by the corrupt political machines of the time. And eventually he was urged by his party to run for vice president. Roosevelt ran on the ticket as vice president under William McKinley. McKinley was assassinated and Roosevelt became the youngest president of the United States at 42 years old. His strong leadership and his visibility, uh, he traveled around the country, endless sources of energy, helped him to create a modern presidency. He was very popular. He was very loved by the people. 
Um, but he was also very passionate about cleaning up corruption in business at this time. Um, he supported the federal government's role in intervening between conflicts of business and government. And often state governments were not powerful enough to stop these corrupt businesses from operating within their country. Roosevelt's plan is called the Square Deal. Now, uh, presidents often come up with a slogan to characterize what they hope to do as president because, like any other politician, they have to sell their idea. And so his square deal is what he was calling his progressive reforms. Now, in 1900, Roosevelt's immediate passion was to break up monopolies. Trusts were financial firms controlling entire industries often. And these trusts were controlling about 80% of American industries. Almost all industries were owned by a handful <coughs> of individuals. And so I'm sure you've heard the rhetoric in the past year that the wealthiest individuals control most of the means of production. And that's what we call an oligopoly. It's different than oligarchy. Oligarchy means a handful of individuals control the government. An oligopoly, an even sillier word, means that a handful of individuals control the means of production. And that's where we were as a country in 1900. And Roosevelt's passion was to change this, to curb the power of the trusts that hurt public interests. Now he managed to break up some of these uh, using an existing law, the Sherman Antitrust Act, which prohibited monopolies from being formed. Roosevelt also intervened personally in a number of labor movements, most famously the 1902 coal strike. When miners went on strike because of their deplorable working conditions, their low pay, their lack of workers' compensation for what is really a very dangerous job. And so they went on strike. Well, coal, especially in 1902, even still today, is an essential industry. With no coal, there would be no power production at this time. With no coal, there would be no steam engines. And so with this coal strike was actually threatening to cripple the United States economy. And so Roosevelt personally called both sides in, uh, the labor representatives and the representatives of management, and he used his executive order to get them to sit down. And he arbitrated this dispute personally. And he threatened federal takeover of this business where they're not a reasonable compromise reached. And so he set a principle here, a federal intervention in the case of business. And really this earned Roosevelt the nickname of Lion Tamer uh, because he was here portrayed in this cartoon as taming these various lions of businesses. The railroads were one of the most powerful corporations in the United States at this time. They represented the transportation infrastructure. They represented a large percentage of the jobs that were being created in the United States at this time. They were one of the largest purchasers of resources, and they were one of the largest economic drivers in the United States at this time. And so, yes, they were very powerful politically. So powerful, in fact, that one could argue they were buying up politicians. Now, how do you stop that? Well, Roosevelt pushed for federal regulation to control these abuses. And one of these was the Hepburn Act. The Hepburn Act limited the amount of passes that railroads could offer to politicians. It also created the Interstate Commerce Commission. 
a federal regulatory body that would set maximum rates on freight. It also, uh, he also pushed for and signed the Elkins Act, which would stop rebates, um, which again were discounts and free rides, uh, one way that railroads were bribing politicians. And then also it would ban sudden rate changes. Because when a monopoly controls an industry, they can charge whatever they want for a good or a service. And these monopolies were doing just that. And now it's time for the federal government to begin to clean that up through legislation. But also the food and drug industry. I don't know if you heard from the clip in the beginning, and I've got a couple more clips to illustrate this. A young journalist named Upton Sinclair decided to take matters into his own hand. He went into journalism because he wanted to change the world. He wanted to expose corruption, just like so many politicians had. He had a very clever idea. He went undercover and he got a job working at a meatpacking industry. His main goal was to expose how immigrants were being exploited in the workplace. He wanted to work alongside immigrants and he wanted to live the life of an immigrant in the United States and he documented his process thoroughly. And when he published his work, it was called The Jungle, he hoped for it to be an expose on how we were treating immigrants as second-class citizens and how we were using immigrant labor for our benefit. Teddy Roosevelt once said of this book that Sinclair aimed for the nation's heart, but he hid it in the stomach. Because also contained within the jungle, and what you're about to see are several excerpts of this book, are vivid descriptions of the nasty ways that our food was being produced. You heard the first clip that the dry dung of rats would fall onto the meat and the workers would just brush it off. How they would set out poison traps for the rats and the poison and the rats together would fall into the vats where the meat was made and it would all get churned up together. And how when you break apart ham and you study what is in ham, people were finding rope and pig skin and a number of unsavory products. And that an only a very small percentage of it is actually good meat. Most of it is byproduct. Pretty nasty business, really. And when this book was published, the pre I mean, there was such an uproar that the president was kind of forced to declare a commission to study this. So Again, there was such a national uproar. People were like, oh my gosh, this is what is in our food? You know, I guess no one had ever really put it into writing before. That the, uh, there was a presidential commission created to study our food industry, in particular, our meat production industry. And um, unfortunately, they confirmed what Sinclair was writing. They were like, oh, yeah, um, this is disgusting. And so Roosevelt pushed for and had, uh, you know, bipartisan support for a law called the Meat Inspection Act, requiring, number one, sanitary requirements in the workplace and a federal meat inspection program. And so now not only are the restaurants where you eat inspected, but the places that produce the meat that you eat in said restaurants are also inspected. Common sense legislation. Writing the jungle was not Sinclair's idea. He'd published an article in the socialist newspaper, Appeal to Reason, about a workers' strike in Chicago. The newspaper asked him to go back and research a book about wage slavery in the meat industry. In disguise as a working man, Sinclair encountered the real-life characters he'd portray in a jungle. 
He was fascinated with the people who were there, with how they looked, with the music, and he made it the material of the jungle. Smart choice. Now, a year has passed in the lives of Sinclair's newlyweds. Ona and Jorgis have an infant son, but shortly after his birth, the disasters pile on. Jorgis's father, Antonis, sickens from working in a cold, wet factory. He dies. Jorgis barely has time to mourn before he slips on a blood-slick floor in the killing room. Homebound with a sprained ankle, he loses his job. Now he was second-hand, he realizes. A damaged article. They did not want him. As Jorgis's strength ebbs, so does Ona's innocence. And when they came to work the next she confesses to Marisia that she submitted to her boss, a man called Connor. Ona becomes pregnant and can't hide the truth from Jorgis. Mad with rage, the laborer attacks Ona's boss and is thrown in jail. Out of work, behind bars, Jurgis surrenders to despair. Chicago has defeated them. He can't imagine the worst is still to come. Once out of jail, Sinclair's hero, Jurgis Rutkis, plunges into new disasters. His worst fear comes true. The bank has taken the house. Then he finds Ona and Marisia in a filthy boarding house. Ona suffers a torturous labor. The infant is stillborn. The ordeal kills Ona. Soon after, the last straw, Jurgis's young son falls through a rotten sidewalk and drowns in the filth beneath. In despair, the laborer simply abandons Chicago and the shattered remnants of his family. What Sinclair has really done is to sort of roll up a lot of different tragedies into the life of one family. That's probably unrealistic for that amount of tragedy to occur within one family. For these types of situations to develop in a community like Packingtown in one or another family was actually quite common. Another result of this law is the Pure Food and Drug, excuse me, of this book is the Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, food and drug advertisements are notorious for making false claims and patenting medicines that are unsafe. You know, today, if your doctor prescribes you a medication, you can rest assured that medication has gone through a long period of trials under a great degree of regulation and if you choose to do so you can go online and you can read these articles summarizing the research about the particular medication you have been subscribed you have access to all of that information however prior to the pure food and drug act you might meet a medicine salesman and you might go to one of their advertisement shows and they might be promising you a medicine that would cure all of your problems <laughs> well don't we all have problems right my ankle hurts my stomach feels upset commonly I feel irritable and grouchy and all of these things that someone might promise I have something that will fix it now studies have been done on these quote patent medicines and the most common active ingredient is alcohol because guess what alcohol temporarily makes you feel better and people consume the medicine and then they think oh I feel better my ankle doesn't hurt anymore my stomach's no longer upset oh there'll be side effects blah 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 hangover 
Well, anyway, um, the Pure Food and Drug Act halts by federal law the sale of contaminated food and medicine, but also it requires truth in labeling so that when you get that prescription medication or when the doctor recommends an over-the-counter medication, you can read the label when you go to CVS or Walgreens or wherever, and you can look what is contained in this product. And you can, of course, now go online and what is this chemical? I can't pronounce it. Well, let's Google it and see what is in there. Of course, that's by federal law that you have access to that information. Ninety-nine percent of Americans are meat eaters, consuming on average about twice their weight in meat each year. We forget that in the 19th century, meat became a production industry and became industrialized, taken out of the home and taken into the factories. Canned meat was an experiment in convenience and catastrophe. Around 1900, during the Spanish-American War, some 1,000 Americans died from tainted meat, about three times the number killed by the Spanish. Before The Jungle was published in 1906, meat-related deaths seemed to be an inescapable fact of life. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are 76 million cases of food poisoning in the United States every year. 332,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths. Most of these deaths are caused by a bacteria called E. coli 0157H7. It comes from cattle feces. Cattle carry it into the slaughterhouses. There, it gets into the meat. Food safety is a shared responsibility. It's got to start with the people who are growing the crops or raising the animals. The people who sell the product through a restaurant or through a grocery store have a responsibility to keep their facilities clean. And then the final food preparer has a responsibility to make sure that they cook foods properly. Forcing the meat industry to do it right was Upton Sinclair's mission nearly a century ago. He'd achieve it by disguising himself as a worker and infiltrating Chicago's packing houses. It was a risky business, but the circumstances of his own life called for desperate measures. He had been there. He had felt the cold. He had not been able to buy food. He had had a leaky roof. So he put that into the jungle, that's for sure. So here's a photograph of a meat inspection um, operated by a U.S. government inspector. So what this is verifying is that all meat produced in this factory has been inspected by an objective third party. Next, I want to move on to Roosevelt's conservation measures. In 1887, the United States Forest Bureau was established and Roosevelt helped set aside 45 million acres of public land to be conserved. That's roughly the size of Germany, the nation. Now, the early 1900s, late 1800s are known as the logging era. And during that time, resource extraction for private benefit was the accepted policy and resources were being consumed, natural resources were being consumed at an uncontrolled rate for profit. Had, had nothing been done, we would have no forests, we would have no mountaintops, we wouldn't have all of this beautiful land that we have. And Roosevelt began this movement, helped to begin this movement, to set aside forest reserves and sanctuaries and national parks. You saw him pictured next to Yellowstone. You saw him pictured next to many multiple national parks that he helped to preserve. 
and I'm forever grateful for that. Now, he believed that these resources were just that, resources. They can still be harvested. The National Forest can still be harvested, and it can still be logged, but it must be done under the watchful, resolute eye of the government. It must be done in a controlled manner. Because he believed that conservation was part preservation and part development for public use. Some areas are designated wilderness areas, like Joyce Kilmer. There are no roads in the Joyce Kilmer Slick Rock Wilderness. In fact, the trails are not even marked. The Shining Rock Wilderness is very similar. You cannot operate a motor vehicle in these wilderness areas. And your access is limited, and it does require some outdoor knowledge to get around safely. Some parks are very developed with paved roads, with visitor centers, with shows and costumed animals and all kinds of fun things. And it just depends on um, how it is set aside under the National Reclamation Act. And then finally, civil rights. Civil rights, that is the movement to ensure equal treatment under the law for all regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, or national origin. That was a very politically divisive topic, as it certainly is today. And no president up to this point had publicly stood up for civil rights. Teddy Roosevelt did not support civil rights for African Americans. Though he was one of the first presidents to invite an African American to the White House, Booker T. Washington. So as far as your essay goes, when you're trying to decide whose idea would be more effective. Booker T. Washington was the first of these two individuals to be invited to the White House. Because remember, it was his idea for blacks to keep their heads down. He literally said that, cast down your buckets. He meant, you know, keep, you know. W.E.B. Du Bois, meanwhile, said, no, we need to commit acts of civil disobedience. We need to protest. We deserve equal rights. In fact, Du Bois went on to found the NAACP during Roosevelt's administration, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, whose goal from 1908-9 to the present is full equality among the races. Yet no new laws in regards to civil rights were passed during Roosevelt's term as president. 